Coming up on Harvard Chan This Week in Health, the future of seafood, from aquaculture to sea greens. This is our next internet, almost. Just the amount of opportunity that we have. In part two of our interview with Barton Seaver, he'll explain how the oceans can help feed a world feeling the effects of climate change and a rapidly expanding population. Hello and welcome to Harvard Chan This Week in Health. It's Thursday, April 13th, 2017. I'm Amy Monomiro. And I'm Noah Levitt. Coming up this week, part two of our conversation with Barton Seaver, a chef, author, and director of the Healthy and Sustainable Food Program at the Center for Health and the Global Environment here at the Harvard Chan School. We spoke to Seaver when he was in Boston for the annual Seafood Expo North America, a massive gathering of seafood suppliers, fishermen, chefs, and restaurateurs, all exploring the future of their industry. And that's the focus of our episode today. In part one, Seaver told us that seafood was a, quote, irrational economy and an unsustainable one in its current form, that we as consumers tell the oceans what we're willing to eat instead of being open to the variety of food that the oceans can provide. And this week, Seaver explores how we can correct that imbalance through new seafood farming techniques and even the growth of new food sources like sea greens. He'll also offer some tips for ways that you can shop and eat for seafood more sustainably. If you missed part one, we'd obviously encourage you to go back and listen to that. And to begin this episode, we wanted to share a quick clip from last week where Seaver explained why Americans in particular have not traditionally eaten much seafood. After that, we'll dive right into our conversation on the future of seafood. Take a listen. Some of this is, is very much rooted in, the, in our cultural history. Uh, you know, it was the barren, rocky shores of New England was not what called the, you know, the immigrants to, to my, you know, to come here. Uh, it, it was the incredibly fertile waters. It was the cod. Uh, it was our first industry. It, it provided for us the first stepping stone towards independence in terms of, you know, accumulation of wealth. But, you know, it, it, in just an odd little twist of world history, um, you know, we were largely colonized by the English and they were tended to be at war with the Catholics for a long time hundreds of years, basically, and uh, fish was seen as a food of penance, as part of the Catholic diet, and there was already sort of a bias against seafood. Governor William Bradford, the first uh, governor of the Plymouth Colony, uh, wrote plaintively, constantly, back to England, saying, you know, when the second wave of pilgrims arrived, and, and, you know, I had to apologize for the best I could offer thee was a lobster and a piece of, of striped bass and a cup of fair spring water. You know, uh, you know, rest thee a while and have faith. God will one day provide for thee better fare. I mean, literally, I've just, like, from the first meal, it's like, ah, I gotta eat seafood? Come on! And then you have manifest destiny and sort of this endless, you know, America had an ocean of a different sort, you know, an ocean of, of, of fertile soil. And, you know, meat has always been an aspirational product. And so I think uh, we sort of, seafood has somewhat been beneath our aspiration in many ways. Uh, you know, meat consumption tops out at 275 pounds in our history, and seafood's topped out at over, just over 16 pounds per person per year. So there is this sort of cultural bias. There's also, um, this seafood has always been seen as different. It's sold in a different section. We go in the, in the store saying, ah, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? All right, what's the protein going to be? Well, you go to the meat case, but seafood's over there. It's in a different section. So automatically, it's literally physically separated from the decision process. Uh, it is highly perishable, and there have been unscrupulous, you know, a lot of unscrupulous uh, uh, happenings where you know, it, people get bad fish. And, um, and so there's just a trepidation, there's a separation, and there's a physical segregation. Um, and there's also just uh, sort of a lack of, of cultural... Um, sort of fluency in seafood, especially once you, once you start heading inland. I know you've kind of talked a lot in the past about kind of the growth of aqu aquaculture, farmed seafood. So how, how does, which is kind of interesting because it seems to be putting it more on the plane of, I guess the way people can understand, like think of like beef and pork and farming and traditional farming. Is seafood kind of heading in that direction in some ways where it's going to, where aquaculture is kind of growing to that point? 
Yes, absolutely. And uh, sort of picking up on your last question, I provided a little bit of the history there, but I think the future is is certainly aquaculture. Uh, aquaculture two years ago surpassed beef production for the first time globally. Uh, and we now eat globally more aquaculture products than we do wild capture uh, fish. Uh, and so it is an industry that is rapidly, rapidly expanding. Uh, and what it represents also is it's an it's a, a economic geography. It's, an, it's a new frontier. You know, it's the blue economy. You know, this is our, our, our next internet, almost. Just the amount of opportunity that we have to harness energy, to grow algae for energy, uh, to grow algae to feed to pigs and chickens and cattle, which reduces their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you know, just the amount of food that we can produce in the oceans is enough to assuage even the most anxious, pessimistic person about, oh my God, how are we going to feed the planet? It's like, well, how about we look to the 70% of the planet, the ocean, that we're currently not really even looking to utilize. And so aquaculture is, you know, it can create, I, I don't have an exact figure, but I would say millions of jobs globally. Um, it could create enough food, enough protein to, to feed the world. Um, we still need vegetables. Eat your vegetables. Um, but, you know, and then there's all sorts of other sort of social benefits that come from aquaculture. That in aquaculture production, more than 50% of people employed in the industry, either primary producers or secondary processors, are women. And this is mostly in developing nations where poverty and women's empowerment issues uh, are driving a lot of much larger macro issues on our planet and just gosh wait I mean we can feed ourselves delicious food that's actually going to save our life too because it's the healthiest food we get we can empower women we can empower small business owners we can create all this food create sort of job security and ultimately what I think is you know, one of the best things is we create an entire economy an entire class of people who is basic function is to be stewards of their environment. And so aquaculture to me is just this catalyst by which everyone wins. From a consumer perspective, is there a bias against aquaculture? Because I think like just like the anecdote is I always think of like when I go to the supermarket and I look at the seafood count, they're, they're so proud the advertising wild caught, wild caught. And then the farmed seafood is like kind of segregated in different sections. So do consumers have a bias towards wild versus farmed? And is, is, is there any reason not to eat farmed seafood? There's absolutely no reason to not eat farmed seafood. No reason at all. There's no reason not to eat wild seafood. I mean, they are equal. They are the same. They should not be segregated. Once it breaks the plane of the water, it is the exact same thing. And by the way, what, what's the last time you ate anything else that wasn't farmed? I mean, literally, you go into a grocery store and right, 100,000 SKUs in the store. Right. Well, seven of them are wild. Everything else we, they, I mean, the history of humanity is farming. And, and somehow we use that, we apply that to aquaculture. We're like, oh my gosh, ever, no, never. It's like, are you listening to yourself? And so I, I don't mean to pick on it because they, there are uh, legitimate conversations. There are legitimate concerns that people have about aquaculture, and I do not diminish that uh, just offhandedly. But I think that when we look at aquaculture from a holistic viewpoint, uh, you know, its impacts versus, well, what else are we eating if we're not eating this farmed salmon? Well, in America, we're eating beef. Well, the beef is not doing our bodies much good, uh, and the beef is certainly, you know, a, a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So it's, huh, there, there's a, a very nuanced conversation to have here. Um, but the, the bottom, the end of the end of the day, just eat seafood. If you are a consumer and you're looking to buy farm seafood, are there things you should be looking for to know that, you know, you're making, you're kind of making the right choice? Sure. Uh, I think both with wild and with farmed, uh, there are uh, a great, great set of tools that you can use. Um, the first and foremost one that I, I suggest to people is is simply to buy domestically produced product. 
Uh, we have the very best management systems uh, in the world for fisheries. And even if the fish is not sustainable, it is managed by a sustainable system towards that goal. And I, I believe that if we believe the system, we should support the products of it. Uh, and aquaculture here is the same. And, and um, so it's a you know, it's not a perfect guarantee, but it, it is a big step forward uh, globally because we import 90% of the seafood we eat. We have to be looking at, at beyond just that uh, uh, that tactic. The Aquaculture Stewardship Council and uh, the best aquaculture practices um, are both certifications that are run um, uh, for producers to gain tiers of uh, certification of the responsibility of their practices. And these are, are coming to be pretty much essential in the marketplace. Uh, and, you know, the producers you know, are, are really feeling the pressure from retailers who are saying, that's great, you're farming shrimp, okay, but you're not doing it right. I'm, not, I'm just not going to buy from you. So if you follow these practices, uh, and so market pressure is making farming better, uh, largely through these tools. Um, and even if they're not public facing, uh, you don't walk into a store and, and often see these things labeled as such. Uh, but what you really should do is do a little bit of, if you're going to do research on anything, believe me, sustainable seafood is a wormhole like you've never seen before. Oh my God. So maybe don't go that deep. Maybe just uh, investigate your retailers. Find people, find fish, you know, find somebody to buy fish from that you really trust. Because almost every major retailer has a, has a rigorous, uh, well-defined sustainability policy that's happening in their, in their back machinations. And, um, you know, groups like Safeway and Whole Foods, I mean, Wegmans, the top amongst them, uh, just, you know, I walk in there and I... I, I it just sustainability leaves my head because I know I'm in safe hands. Uh, and I think that's the greatest thing that, that we can do. So you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, like more than anything, eat seafood. Seafood is better nutritionally, better environmentally than like beef, for example. But so, and you probably get this asked all, all the time, but like if you are a consumer kind of, what are some of the most problematic seafood maybe out there from a sustainability perspective? And then what are some swaps that people could make to kind of make a, a better, healthier choice for themselves and the environment? The very best swap that you can make uh, across the board for any type of seafood is what's the catch of the day? Uh, simply, you know, what's in season? What's running? What's plentiful? What do you got? Um, and that begins to address what I was talking about earlier, sort of the, that irrational economy. It, when we ask what's available, it's different than telling them what we want. Uh, and there are situations like with farmed salmon. It's like, well, you know, one third of the internet is farmed salmon recipes. The other two thirds is chicken recipes. So, you know, I mean, there's, there's such an ingrained um, uh, sort of predilection to that, and that's fine. But uh, you know, bluefin tuna some of the really majestic, long-lived species uh, that are highly valuable and targeted. Uh, I mean, that's a particularly sort of imperiled one, uh, but also one that's, that's really very hard to replace because it is so unique. Uh, so when it comes to, to this, uh, again, trust your retailer, um, but there's also sort of some steps that we can just take to mitigate our impacts before we even consider the species, which is to say, how much, how big of a portion do we actually need? Eight ounces, that doesn't do you any good past four ounces. Your body just doesn't need that much protein. Uh, we can get all the omegas that we need from smaller portions. And guess what? What else fills your plate? The good stuff, broccoli and beans and grains and rice. Woo, okay, the stuff that we know will sustain us. And so a little earlier, you were kind of talking about like, a lot of like the bycatch, these like less popular fish that are wasted. I mean, we talk about dogfish, skate wing, monkfish, et cetera. What, like what can be done from like the perspective of people who are chefs who are in food service to encourage people to maybe try these fish that they haven't heard of or maybe have a strange perception of? A couple of things. I, I just finished writing a book on the history of the American seafood industry uh, through sort of a, a narrative and anthrop anthropological sketch of every single species. And it is un 
it, it, it was unimaginable to me how much uh, sort of turnover there's been in terms of our preferred species. Uh, bluefish, mackerel, tilefish, scup, uh, por- you know, another word for uh, porgy. These were once so popular as to be the most valuable fish in the country. Um, and, I mean, and then you know, just the, the, the species that we used to like, uh, we used to eat so much herring and sardines and all these things that now people use as sort of the the archetype of, whoa, you know, that's too fishy, you know. We've almost demonized them in a way for a preference of sort of mild white fish. Um, so our preferences have really shifted. And so what that means to me is, well, they can keep shifting then. So there's a chance here. We're, you know, we're not stuck in a, in a prison of, of white fish. Um, and, you know, I, I very successfully uh, did this in my own restaurant, uh, which is I, I no longer have. But uh, I had a rule with fishermen, what you catch, I will buy. And I'll figure out how to sell it. And over the course of two years, we served over 165 different species of seafood. And we had Autobahn guides more than cookbooks in our kitchen because we'd open the box. And be like, oh, oh, what's that? <laughs> But here's the thing about fish. Every single fish I've ever had, when well cared for, is delicious. Um, and it's also probably very similar to a category that you're familiar with. Um, and so the, the uh, method was story. Oh, well, this bluefish came fresh out of the water today from Deal, Maryland. It's about 35 miles down this way. Shallow waters where the, you know, uh, just really brackish and there's this great influx of, of, of life there and just big blooms of life and the bluefish just come running through. And it's like, I've already sold you. Yeah, just be, but I sold you a story. Uh, and we're also through uh, the center at Harvard. We've done a lot of work, institutions and college and, and university hospital food service. Uh, trying to help them diversify to better uh, achieve their sustainability goals. And what I found was the greatest impediment to sustainability, to trying those new fish, was uh, the recipe. We cook in a command control operating system that we open the recipe, the recipe says cod, baked in spiced tomato sauce. Okay, well, you go to the store, I need cod. And so from the very beginning, you have a recipe telling you what to do and, and manifesting in, in your impact on the environment. Instead of the recipe just reading flaky white flesh fish, such as cod or pollock or haddock or cake or musk, or, you know, just like on down the line, you go to the store, you get the freshest, best fish that's available to you at the best price, you go home, guess what? They cook exactly the same. The recipe reads the, you know. Um, and so what I began to sort of tell them is sell the dish, not the fish. People are trepidatious about, oh, oh uh, hake? I don't, I don't know what I like. I don't know if I like that. Oh, baked in spiced tomato sauce over almond rice pilaf. Oh, wait, what was the fish again? It doesn't matter. I know exactly what that tastes like. And so it's really taking the taboo of thinking about seafood species by species and really thinking of it categorically. Oh, I love flaky white flesh fish. That's great. What do you got today? Just that mental shift creates a, a groundswell movement to, or should I say a sea change, um, towards uh, enabling a more sustainable fishery. Maybe something that doesn't have much of a story, but I know you just wrote a cookbook on it, are sea greens. Um, and that's one of the panels um, that you're on here at the Expo. So I wanted, I guess for people who, who don't know what are sea greens and why are they kind of this potentially really good solution to, to food challenges? Like, and are they, a, I guess, they're, are they a viable food option in the future? First, let me uh, just set the context here. Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of what seaweed is. You know, it's the stuff that gathers up in rack on the beach after a high tide. Uh, You go wading into the shallows, and it's the stuff that obscures the bottom. You can't see what's swimming around you. It wraps around your legs, weird tentacle feeling. Oh, it's creepy, right? Okay, that's not what we're talking about. It's not. Get that out of your head. That's not what we're talking about. What we were talking about is this beautiful, 
long, billowing leaves of kelp that grow in the top of the water column in super cold, crisp, clean waters, absorbing these amazing marine flavors and bromides and just this rich umami, you know, bomb. So it just makes everything it's served with taste better. We're talking about Alaria and, and we're talking about dulse and these beautiful products that just you know, sort of shimmer and billow in the water and are a product of their environment. And wow, okay. So that's why I call them sea greens, is to get away from that taboo of that bad memory and, um, because they really are something completely different. And yeah, uh, the healthfulness of them is astounding uh, in terms of their nutrient load, uh, you know, the nutrition that they deliver. Uh, in a in a complete package, I'm not a reduction. I don't believe in reductionist nutrition, uh, and uh, from a sustainability standpoint, they require zero input. You plant, you you, you know, seed uh, the the kelp onto a, onto a rope, dangle the rope and you know from a raft in the water column, and basically come back six months later, and there it is, uh, zero input. So. Yes, actually, if you're eating kelp, your lunch is free, um, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but it also grows so prolifically, um, and it can be grown in association with other species so that you have integrated aquaculture where you might have fin fish, salmon. You might have mussels around that, sea cucumbers, wrasse, scallops. And then around this, you might have seaweed. And what we're doing here is just creating a Biomimic, you know, biomimicry. It's, it's, I mean, that's how nature is. Nothing exists in a monoculture. Uh, and so not only can it be produced basically a, it, from an environmental standpoint for free, uh, it can actually reduce the impact of other production models. And furthermore, uh, there's a lot of research now showing that it's a carbon sink, that it, it uh, actually improves in the quality of water that it's grown in. Uh, and it mitigates some of some of the larger impacts. And then in terms of its health, I mean, just the nutrient load is, is there, incredible fiber, uh, you know, great deal of iodine, and, and more Americans are iodine deficient than, are, uh, than have too much in their diets. Um, you know, at one point the government put iodine in salt because we needed it, and uh, now that we're not using a lot of iodized salt, uh, that's been a trend in, in food production. Uh, we actually need a source of iodine. Uh, many of us do. So uh, this is just an incredible opportunity. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity also to create jobs. And so just as a way of finishing up and kind of touching on something that you talked about earlier is kind of seafood, kind of, in a sense, being able to feed the planet. I, I, there was one prediction from um, someone at Harvard, Sam Myers, that we need to increase food production by 70% over the next 40 years to keep up with global demand. And so how, how does seafood fit into that? And where I guess where do you see seafood kind of going in terms of its its profile? Like, do you envision us eating more and more seafood over the next four decades? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have to. You know, we're we're running out of arable land. Uh, there's just not more farmland, and we're not gonna. We shouldn't cut down the more rainforest to make it. Uh, we're running out of fresh water. Uh, there are. You know, and and we're also facing global weather patterns that are are. Uh, yeah, substantially different and, and are, are placing traditional agriculture at great risk in many places. So just relying on the tried and true sort of commodity crops it just isn't going get, to get us there. It has to be part of our diet, of course, but we have to look to the oceans. It's 70% of the planet, and we're not utilizing it for our food production. Uh, not only are more mouths coming, we're going to have to feed those people in addition to the mouths we already have. So not only are we gonna have more people needing food, but social trends, growing wealth, uh, growing middle class in China and India uh, is increasing the per capita consumption of seafood. So not only are there more people, but those people are eating more seafood. Uh, so there, there's a lot of pressures being placed on this. Uh, but fortunately, this is an industry of innovation. Uh, it's a young industry too. You know, this was sort of dabbled with in the late 60s. And it didn't really come into massive production until late 70s, 80s. I mean, think about where a computer was back in 1980. 
you know? I mean, that's, that's kind of how, if you think about it that way, wow, do we have a long way to go. Isn't this an exciting opportunity? Um, and one that's going to provide, I think, really a lot of moral and spiritual sort of solace to those of us who are really concerned about our presence here on this planet. That was Barton Seaver on the future of seafood. And if you are looking for some more information on the best and most sustainable types of fish to buy, Seaver recommends the Monterey Bay Aquarium's Seafood Watch Program. It offers information about the environmental impacts of certain fishing practices and has great tips for consumers and businesses. We'll have a link to the Seafood Watch Program on our website, hsph.me slash thisweekinhealth. We'll also have a link to Seaver's website, which has some great recipes if you want to try some new approaches to cooking seafood. That's all for this week's episode. I'm Amy Montemiro. And I'm Noah Levitt. A reminder that you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, or listen anytime at soundcloud.com slash Harvard Public Health.